Uh, welcome back, everybody. It is Friday afternoon and on um, Friday the 8th, and we are here today to take on more testimony about the outcomes of the work that we did last year on mitigating homelessness in the face of COVID. And with us today are Gus Selig and Jen Holler from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, Richard Williams, the Executive Director for the Vermont State Housing Authority, and Maura Collins from the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. And um, for folks who are just joining us and for the new folks on the committee, the, this team of people um, put together the and engineered the programs that we're gonna hear about today, um, which was um, both finding, well, there's three pieces, um, finding new units and creating new units for people who have been experiencing homelessness so that we can um, create uh, homes that are safe for people when they need to be safe at home. Um, the State Housing Authority managed a program that paid uh, rental arrearages, some up to 18 months is what I heard earlier this year, in order to keep people in their homes. And the uh, Housing Finance Agency spent money or was allocated money to help with Vermonters who are having trouble with their mortgages. So we are going to hear from them and see how we did, um, how closely did we get to pinpointing the number of the funds that we gave them and what can we do better moving forward. Um, we have a slug of money coming at us that's far greater than the amount of money than we were given this past year. And so that'll be for a future date of how we work with that money. But I just wanted to, that's the tee up and I'll start with Gus and then go to Richard and then Maura if that's okay. Um, if you do have time um, constraints, if anybody has a time constraint, any of the witnesses, please let me know and I'll, and I'll switch it around. But if, if we can work with that uh, to start off with, that would be great. And so I'll just pass the microphone over to you, Gus. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. For the record, I'm Gus Selig. I'm the director uh, for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. With me is our policy director, Jen Holler. I'm having a little computer difficulty in screen sharing today, so she'll drive um, the presentation we're going to give you. I want to start just by thanking the committee um, for the great work you did last year in response to the pandemic and for the trust you put in all of us um, uh, to expend uh, funds that the feds had given us as wisely as we possibly could. I do because there's four members of the committee that are new. I want to give you a little bit of context about the board and its role. Um, but I'm going to start um, just by briefly saying of the $34.5 million you provided to us in three different buckets, all but $1.35 million has been committed and spent on projects that will produce, that will make 12 shelters with a little over 250 beds safer and produce about 247 um, new units of housing, some new shelters, uh, which we'll uh, show you in a few minutes, and lots of new apartments all around the state. Um, this was an incredible effort. Usually housing projects are in process for several years and so to have to try to pull this together over a six seven month period uh, took remarkable cooperation and coordination um, i do want to note though you're not going to get into it today that maybe the most important thing that you did more important than our programs was to make sure more people did not become homeless and so i really want to tip my hat to richard williams and his staff for the incredible job they did uh, in administering that program. And I wanna say, I think the most important thing you can do in the short term is to make sure that people who are struggling to pay their rent have the ability through the new money to pay and not take months and months to get that out the door. Um, so we'll begin to screen share here. And um, again, we're the Housing and Conservation Board. This first photo that you're looking at is of the Committee on Temporary Shelter, uh, which we helped along with Maura Collins and her agency build at uh, North Avenue just a few years ago. It includes the day station and other properties. Um, a bit about our mission. Um, we were created back in the mid 80s when real estate was booming tremendously. It is again now. We're funded primarily by the property transfer tax. We've been part of the capital budget for years. 
Um, but our goals, as outlined in the statute that your predecessors gave us, um, goes to both housing and conservation and does it because it's of critical importance to the economic vitality and quality of life in the state. And when you think about housing, uh, I guess the first thing I want to say, and I, I had this conversation with somebody at the UVM Medical Center, housing is health care. And I think the pandemic made that made us all understand that in a way we hadn't before. In terms of the board's mission, what you're looking at is the archite an architect's rendering of what the build out is going to be like um, at the old Burlington College site, which will be close to 700 homes. We've already helped to build and open about 140 of them in two different buildings, with a quarter of them for fo folks who'd been experiencing homelessness. This development going to our dual mission also included the city taking on a, what is a new 12 acre park right on the waterfront. And there is public access through this property for all the residents of the North, old North End down to the water. Um, so that's how our dual goals sometimes get realized. Why don't we go to the next slide, Jen? This is what we've done over 33 years. I'm not gonna dwell on it today, but as the general committee, um, we're happy to talk to you about um, any number of other issues that we work on that may be of benefit to your constituents uh, one way or another. I do want to note that among the affordable homes, both rental and home ownership that we've worked on over the years, a, a little over 10% of them are what we call supportive housing developments. Um, and that's anything from assisted living to elders um, to there's a development in Burlington for people who struggle with chronic and persistent mental mental illness. There's another one like that in Randolph. We've worked with pretty much every shelter in the state over the years to provide um, them with capital either to purchase a property or to fix it up. Um, the photos you're looking at on the left, we work on the whole range of housing as a single family home in Milton. Uh, in the middle is a new town forest in Newberry. And on the right is a building in Waterbury. It's actually an architectural gem. It was the old Waterbury Seminary up in the center. And I'm told by the former owner, Eric Chittenden of Chittenden Cider, that the community had voted three times over 20 years to tear the building down. And it's now among the best housing in the community, just absolutely gorgeous. Let's go to the next slide. Um, our mission uh, is permanent affordability um, and to provide housing that will continue to be affordable, not just for one generation, but on an ongoing basis. And the view of that from a policy perspective is that's the most cost effective investment that you can make. And you avoid displacement when you invest in permanent affordability. On the left is a new building just opened in downtown St. Albans on a site that was really blighted um a uh, really terrible building that i toured about a year and a half ago there's a second building going up this one is being developed has been developed by the champlain housing trust the other building is a private developer this one will have 30 apartment has 30 apartments in it again with a quarter of them uh available to folks who had have experienced homelessness you're also looking at a building in downtown hardwick that we worked on after a terrible fire in the early 1990s. And let's keep moving through the presentation. So our role as a, and we are a quasi public entity. Um, the legislature actually appoints through the speaker and the committee on committees, four members of our 11 member board is to create and preserve affordable housing for lower income Vermonters. The statute says that's anybody below median our focus has primarily been on very low income and extremely low income Vermonters. When we were invented, the state spent not a nickel in its budget on affordable housing, and we became the vehicle for the state to invest in housing. We provide both grants and loans. Um, uh, and in the context of today's discussion, that includes buildings for people who have experienced homelessness. It's been, you specifically asked us to help the emergency shelters and to create some transitional housing. The other thing we do is to support a network of nonprofits that cover every corner of the state. And I need to tell you that that's a rarity in rural states. Usually in, in rural communities, um, only the bigger towns get help uh, and have nonprofits that can help them 
deliver federal housing resources and state resources to their communities. And, and, um, but, but we work all over the state. We also do policy work and Jen's gonna talk about the next slide and the roadmap to end homelessness. So Jen. So the, um, Gus mentioned that um, we do a good bit of policy work. Um, I seem to be having trouble advancing the slide here. Let me try a different method. It was working a minute ago. There we go. Um, so a number of years ago, the legislature funded a study and other organizations contributed um, resources as well. And uh, VHCB, um, VH, the Vermont Housing and Finance Agency, the State Housing Authority, all of those of us um, testifying today, along with the Agency of Human Services and um, that you heard from this morning, um, took a look at what it would take to end homelessness in Vermont, what did, um, and uh, essentially um, contracted with a, um, a national firm that looked at what we were doing here in Vermont and then what needed to be done to really reach that goal. Um, you can see the five main recommendations here and um, the chairman asked about uh, the pluses and minuses of what has happened. One of the, one of the pluses in a way of the CRF funding and, and, and COVID is that it helped us accelerate this work. It just allowed us to, to direct some resources to it. Um, a lot of this uh, work that had been done early on through um, coordinated entry, you heard about that this morning, establishing that at the local level um, and simply building a, a consistent database across the state had been done. So in many ways, we were poised to be able to do this work, and, uh, but it really took some additional resources. Um, and there's, um, in Vermont, we've got good systems, good collaboration, and it's really a, um, a lack of resources that, is, uh, that gets in the way of us really achieving the goal of ending um, functional homelessness. And a big part of the way we um, do that and the way we were able to use the CRF funding is through the, um, the uh, nonprofit network that Gus referenced just a minute ago. Here's a map that shows all of those organizations across the state and their service territories. Um, when you look to your part of the state, you may um, see the organization that may sound familiar to you. Um, but these are BHCB's primary partners and through them we grant the state funds and federal funds and most recently the CRF funding um, to do housing development in large and small communities in all corners of the state. This group went to extraordinary efforts in order to gear up and be ready to um, use the CRF funding when it began to become clear that the legislature was uh, going to allocate some through VHCB. They um, scoured their communities for opportunities to find housing that could be created in a very short time frame. Um, and since then, they have been working um, at an incredible pace to acquire those properties, to rehab them, um, and to coordinate with their service partners at the local level to set up services for the housing um, and to um, get folks primarily those who are temporarily placed in motels into those units. Um, so without this sort of delivery system, it really wouldn't have been possible for Vermont to use the CRF funds to create permanent housing in the way, in the way that we were all able to do. And I'll turn it back to Gus. Okay. Um, so getting to the issue, back to the issue of homelessness, and I, I, before I get into that in depth, I just also want to call out um, there are eight local housing authorities across the state, along with Richard's organization that works statewide, and their work and the work of our nonprofit partners is becoming more and more integrated as time goes on through programs like SASH, but also in terms of the effort to get work on the coordinated entry system and get people housed or rehoused as rapidly as possible. And in some cases, as you'll see in a minute in Rutland, they've actually played quite a leadership role in making housing work. Um, in 2016, Governor Shumlin issued an executive order. He asked that all owners of publicly funded housing make 15% of their apartments available to folks who'd experienced homelessness. Um, at that time, I think as we measured it, about 12% of those uh, units 
those apartments were were so occupied, but the var there was a variation in how much depending on the sponsor. So everybody made a concerted effort. We're now statewide above 16%, um, and some folks are as high as 40%. Uh, in fiscal year 20, um, about a third of all turnovers went to families who were experiencing homelessness. Uh, the photo you're looking at here is a is what we call permanent supportive housing. Um, it was the old Lamplighter Motel on Route 5 in Brattleboro that's been converted into uh, permanent supportive housing for, I believe, 19 households. Uh, and they did just an incredible job. Is a collaboration between the mental health agency, the local homeless service provider, and the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Unless Chip wants to ask a question. Does Chip want to ask a question? Go for it. Um, sure. Um, Gus, um, we're Families with children given priorities in, in, in uh, being housed in some of these units. I mean, that was the design, that was the intent, I guess. Yes, is the short answer. And um, one of the new facilities um, is for a group called STEPS, which we'll get to in a moment, okay. which is the domestic violence organization up in uh, Chittenden County. Um, and um, as we looked at where were the, as AHS told us, where are the priority parts of the state to work in. Uh, we very much looked at those parts of the state that had the largest numbers of families that, with children who were homeless as first priority of where to go. Um, so uh, uh, for instance, we brought 15 units online in Bennington at a development um, where they had a large number of families with children in the motels. So that uh, we've worked on that around the state. I know at the end of um, last year, we had about 300 ho uh, um, families with children, uh, homeless. Um, would, ha have they all been accommodated at this point? Do you know? Um, what I would say to you, and Jen has the numbers, uh, is, is one, uh, some number have. A lot of these units have just come online in the last 30 days. More are coming online this coming month. But the nature of the economic crisis that's gone on with this pandemic means that even as we get some people housed, we're finding that more people have fallen out of their housing. And so we are nowhere close to having solved this problem yet. And and what we hear from, and I think you pro I didn't listen to this morning's testimony, um, but I know that um, uh, OEO has issued rental assistance to a number of families who are in motels and they simply cannot find housing, which begs the question, the, the question, the part of this that we work on is the supply issue. Uh, Richard is the king of rental assistance, okay. um, but we work on the supply end of it and we need, we need more housing. Um, so these are three examples of projects that want the, on the top left is uh, a building in St. Johnsbury that was brought back online. In the middle is the Bayview in Chittenden County, which is which was a motel and is now 68 apartments. More than half have already been occupied. Uh, and the bottom left photograph is a development that a group called Evernorth, you, you probably know them as Housing Vermont, um, bought just about a month ago. And there are four or five apartments there that are designated for people who are coming in from the coordinated entry system. Uh, Gus, before we before we um, go on, uh, just quickly, Chip, um, if you, I know you have to step away this morning, but the information that o of where the kids were at the at very least, and um, but not so much about where they're going because of the because of the issue with the um, availability of units uh, that Gus was just talking about. And Gus, if um, this being the beginning of the session. Um, I told my committee earlier today that we'd, we'd be running across acronyms that we may not know about, and you use the acronym SASH. Um, could you just quickly explain that for us? Yes, and please, when any new members or even people who've been around a while but are my age and can't keep all the acronyms straight, interrupt me. Um, uh, SASH is Support and Services at Home. It is a program... Uh, about 
15 years ago, we and our partners at VHFA got a large grant from the MacArthur Foundation, and we used a small amount of it to work with Cathedral Square, which created a program that is very much based around housing and in housing to provide supports for people. This is, they focused on the elderly um, that brings together all the various service providers um, who work in a kind of team approach to support people's health and wellness. And it's it's had two national evaluations. It's worthy of a hearing all on its own. I think it goes to the point, Mr. Chairman, and perhaps this is what you wanted to, the point you wanted to make of housing as health care. Uh, but it has been demonstrated to have long-term savings to Medicare, which is the funding source for it, reducing falls, reducing the need for people to be hospitalized um, and generally be healthier. Uh, lots of good stories that um, the people who are actually operating the program can tell you, but but um, but the one I will tell you about the SASH program is when Secretary Racine was running the Agency of Human Services, we took him on a tour of supportive housing projects and we had a discussion of SASH when it was then in his, its infancy. And he had people from the, from the Agency on Aging and, the, and Home Health and others around the table and they were discussing some cases with him that they had resolved. And, um, and one of them was a medical management case. And the secretary said, well, wouldn't you just do that in your day job? And it really took the folks from the different agencies talking together about a case to realize that the problem was a medical management of medication issue that was causing somebody to seem like they had, they were probably, they were, they were just losing it, um, having trouble with memory and so on. And once that got straightened out, their lives were just back to normal and fine. So it's, it's a program that's had great results and one that the new members of the committee should learn more about. Uh, in terms of the results of your investment, um, as I said, 247 new units have been, are, have, were made available um, through our investment of just under, just over $32 million, 220 are complete two are completed, 153 have been occupied with 185 people in those units. And then 12 shelters all over the state, um, some that were not on the OEO system, like uh, there's a veterans facility in the Bradford area, um, came to us looking to make improvements to their, uh, to comply with CDC guidance. Um, so it's had a tremendous impact um, and I'll take you through a few of them. Some of you may know that uh, the board actually turned down a proposal from the city of Burlington to use shipping containers as housing. Um, and our board simply felt it was not an adequate proposal. It was on a site that the mayor would have had to use emergency powers for zoning and they would have had to get moved. And that was a good decision because what happened is uh, we turned that down in August. In October, we approved a purchase in Champlain Inn which is both housing more people, has another building nearby on the site that can be used for services, uh, and the property began to be occupied um, in early December. Uh, I think a lot of these folks were living in campers uh, that the state had made available on the Burlington waterfront. Um, so, and, uh, so we're very happy about it. Um, before the hearing began, um, uh, Representative Triano and I were talking about uh, the changes at a mobile home park that were made some years ago in Hardwick and uh, with what we call zero energy modular housing. And we are using that model again. Uh, what you're looking at here are, is a home that's being delivered to a mobile home park in Bristol, in walking distance of the community. Um, that's, that is now about to be occupied. The John Graham shelter is getting three of these homes. Uh, there will be five more delivered, including two to the park in Hardwick and several in Bradford, uh, over the next two months. Uh, this is one that had a supply chain interruption and that's why they're not all in yet. Uh, the manufacturer simply was not able in their usual time frame, to be able to source things like windows um, or the heating systems um, uh, uh, that make these facilities work. Um, 
so well, but they are zero energy units that are coming in. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, this is the conversion of a John Deere dealership in on Woodstock Avenue in Rutland, nine units sponsored by the um, Rutland Housing Authority in partnership with the Medical Center. Uh, this was the most substantial rehab we undertook. Uh, there's a firm out of Brandon called Naylor and Breen that we've worked with in the past. And they did in six months what would usually be about a 10 month, 11 month build. Um, they worked Saturdays, they worked 10 hour days, and they got the job done. And we're really grateful for their, their good work um, and the partnership of the medical center. And I should say for uh, Representative Howard, uh, ground will be broken on the school um, the, uh, uh, on Lincoln Ave, I believe it is, um, in the next month or so. And that will mean at the end of the year, we'll have 19 more uh, units of permanent supportive housing in the community. Let's keep moving. Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I would just, may I just say, I am so pleased and so thankful. Um, they have done an amazing job on Woodstock Avenue and uh, the school, uh, which was the old um, um, Catholic grade school is just gonna be fantastic. Uh, the location is great and I am so grateful. Thank you so much. Well, thanks as always goes back to your constituents who actually do the work. We get your the, their tax dollars back to them. Um, so there's always a lot of discussion or has been in recent years about tiny homes, um, downstreet housing, Washington County Mental Health have a partnership with Norwich University, which designed these tiny homes. Um, the first one was delivered just about a year ago um, because of the pandemic. Norwich students could not finish the second tiny home, so we used CRF funding to get it finished, and it's now been delivered. Um, and Representative Walsh. Walsh. Whoops, thank you, Gus. Uh, our former mayor once promised us uh, quite a few of these things. So you, do you know if there's anything else in the pipeline? Um, I don't know. Um, I, these are not as inexpensive as we hoped they'd be, uh, even with mm. the student labor. Um, they're nearly as expensive as the zero energy modular homes that I just I showed you a, a, a few minutes ago that are coming out of Maine and, and are less than half mm. the size. So uh, this is going to be a tough thing to make money at um, if we want them to be energy efficient for our climate, which is what these, these homes are. But it's, it's been a great ex experiment, and I know that um, both Downstreet and Washington County Mental Health are very happy that, they're, uh, that they've been able to be completed. And, and this unit was, these units were actually on donated land from the former mayor of Barrie. He purchased a, he purchased right. a house and property that was not in good condition, that was fairly blighted, and, and they were able to rezone and, and get this built like this. So um he's been very he's been very on top of um the needs in his community the area is quite blighted and so it anything that we like this is very welcome yep let's move on this is a um a facility uh from a group in brattleboro called groundworks um that will be both um that will provide shelter uh, and they are adding bed partitions, touchless faucets, ventilation system um, that will, uh, this is one of the projects that um, is benefiting from the fact that the feds extended the deadline, um, otherwise would not have been able to be completed. Let's keep moving along. Um, again, this is the John Graham shelter in, in uh, Virgens um, and again, the new flooring that are new countertops that are easier to clean, touchless faucets, dishwashers, new bathrooms, acrylic dividers, and, and ventilation system. And I, I really should call out um, the Vermont Energy Investment Corporation and Efficiency Vermont, which became the consultants to help people um, figure out how to, what kind of ventilation systems they needed and how to get them installed. And they did really good work. And while I'm, um, saying good things about others, 
I just want to note that uh, the folks at the Environmental Board adopted emergency regulations, and that Woodstock Avenue project you saw a moment ago would not have been possible if they didn't um, do everything in their power to keep it on schedule, and, and they did a great job of that by using their emergency rules to help speed along the permitting process. And ultimately, no neighbors uh, opposed it, um, uh, which also made a big difference. Let's keep moving along. Um, one of the things that came to us at the very end of our awarding of funds was th that uh, the need for an isolation facility, a quarantine facility for people who were ill, uh, we had converted one on the Shelburne Road for that purpose that was about twice as big as the Ho-Hum in South Burlington. And so this facility was purchased. Champlain Housing Trust is operating it. Um, it is mostly full right now, which is not a good thing. Hopefully the, the need for it will go away and it will eventually be converted to housing. But that also allowed them to, to return Harbor Place to being used as transitional housing for homeless folks, uh, which has a greater capacity and greater need. Here's another um, shelter that's gotten assistance in Rutland, um, helping victims of domestic violence. And again, the same sorts of things that we were allowed to do with CRF funding of, of uh, touchless fixtures, bathroom renovations, um, some additional uh, outside space to allow for more social distancing in the facility. Uh, and just want to note, this is a pre-COVID picture, not a COVID, pic COVID times picture of people being close together without masks. Um, let's move along. Um, this is the uh, facility for victims of domestic violence that was purchased um, in Chittenden County by the Champlain Housing Trust. Uh, Steps is the operator of the facility. And I think the plan is that after about five years, they'll actually take ownership of the facility and again is sheltering adults and kids. Um, this is a really interesting property in West, in the village of West Brattleboro. It's just a little bit of one street up from Route 9, um, owned by a woman in her 90s. It, it, as you can see from the dining room, it's had some really grand days. It's a little bit tired, but a lot of rehabilitation has taken place and it's going to provide 27 apartments in this building. There's also, it comes with a total of 17 acres. So we think ultimately this will be a great area to help the West Brattleboro Village develop and expand uh, on some of the other acreage. Um, so um, a few years ago, and I would encourage the committee again, and perhaps with some of your colleagues to hear from uh, Dr. Megan Sandell from the Children's Health Watch in Boston, coined the phrase that housing is a vaccine. Um, it prevents all kinds of illness. If, uh, if we had more time today, I would talk more extensively about this. Uh, but if you think about what it would be to be a diabetic and not have a place to refrigerate your medicine, if you understand how disruptive it is for kids uh, in their social emotional development when they have no place to, that is secure to live, and what it does to family dynamics when, when a family loses their housing. You understand, as we all now understand as a result of this pandemic, um, that people just can't live safely without housing and without a reasonable amount of quality housing, meaning space. Um, our shelter capacity is smaller now than before the pandemic, even as we have added a couple shelters. Um, so I think as I, as I finish up this report on what we did with CRF funding, I just wanna again emphasize, we have a supply problem in Vermont and we need more units. We need to bring units back online. That's been part of our historic work. And last thing I just wanna say as a way of, um, and this is a conversation I had with your outgoing chair uh, from Danville, Representative Toll, there we, at the beginning of December, when the feds had not extended the deadline, we told the state that we would not be able to use $1.35 million. Um, we would certainly like to put those dollars back to work, and we will would like to work with this committee, um, whether through our regular funding or through any new assistance the feds offer us. And right now, there is no capital on the table. Uh, in the current relief bill that just passed. 
uh, but hopefully there'll be a further relief bill. We, we will look forward to working with you to continue to renovate housing and to expand the supply and to convert facilities um, that can be converted to housing. Um, so I'm gonna stop there, Mr. Chairman. I know you have other witnesses. I'm happy to answer questions. We have one from Representative Triano. Yes, just briefly, Gus, do you have any reports on the uh, Rural Edge project in downtown St. Johnsbury? Uh, there was one picture of, uh, oh, oh, you mean the the, what, the big project downtown? Yeah, the uh, New Avenue Hotel. Um, it's under construction. It's due yeah. to be finished, I think, next fall. And that will provide 40 apartments. And again, a quarter of those apartments will be reserved for people who've experienced homelessness. Yeah, and I just want to conclude by saying um, you guys took the ball and ran with it. Um, just a fantastic job. And viewing all this is just heartwarming. Well, well, again, we've been very fortunate to have your support and the committee's support and your influence on the appropriators is really appreciated. I, I think as you look at our work beyond uh, the re beyond the CRF funding we, in, over, and going back to the housing revenue bond, but historically we've been able to have big impacts in pretty much every downtown around the state. We're just about to open a building in downtown Springfield. Um, that was a wreck and it's right in the center of town and um, it will provide, as you're gonna see in downtown St. Johnsbury, some good commercial space along with 20 apartments, four of which are and have already been occupied for homeless youth. So lots of good things happening. I think for Representative Brong, we've just opened some housing um, in Virgins. Uh, again, it's mixed income, but with some housing reserved for people who've experienced homelessness. You know, I know several people who have um, moved into that. They're, they're very grateful to have the opportunity for reasonably priced housing in the area. So, no, that was, that was a great project. Representative Hengo. Yeah, I just want to build on what Representative Triano just said. When, when we first heard that we were going to be doing this, these projects with um, 200 plus new units, I thought to myself, how is that ever going to happen by the end of 2020? And I just, my hat is off to you for getting this done. And I'm just amazed at the numbers that you have posted there for us. So congratulations and thank you for all your hard work. Well, thank you. And there we know, and you asked lots of good, tough questions, and I really appreciate it because it helps us do our job better when we have to think hard about it. Um, we know St. Albans is one of those areas that needs more help. We did give the shelter some help, um, but they had another building that they wanted to buy. And then, and you may know this story, they did the environmental review and some questions were raised that made the board feel like there's no way we can do this by December 30th. Um, I was just on the phone with a couple of people the other day that now that we have another year, would like to take another shot at that. So again, if there are more resources, um, there are several parts of the state where we didn't have nearly as big an impact uh, as we would have liked to. Um, there were hard negotiations in the Hartford area and here in central Vermont where I live um, and ultimately, you know, we do work between willing buyers and willing sellers. And in those cases, the sellers were just not ready to sell properties that could have been converted. So there are more opportunities out there if we can get the federal partnership that I know we all need um, to make those things happen. And we, we look forward to working with you on it. But thank you for your words. And I really appreciate that you're going to circle back around with the shelter in St. Albans. That's great. Thank you. Welcome. Representative Blumley. Hi. <clears throat> um, that was a great presentation. Uh, and I, I, I just have a, a kind of a, maybe a process for Tom. I mean, question for Tom, but so you talk about this 1.3 million remaining, right? And so what, what, who decides where that goes? How, how is it this committee that, you know, um, looks at that? I'll stop there. No, um, once the, once VHCB offered back the 1.35, that was um, 
kind of vacuumed up into the larger funds. People were, the, the administration was constantly reclaiming funds. We'll hear this from Richard and we'll hear this from Mora as well, where money was taken back in because, because of the deadline, because it had to be expended by the end of the year. There was a real, um, people had to make decisions on whether or not we would be able to expend the money. VHCB looked at this, you know, looked at this 1.35 and said, we're not going to get this done. And so it, re it, I guess it reverted back to the administration um, and they would, they made a request. They, they, they aggregate the money that they were able to sweep back in and then they would make requests of the joint fiscal committee who met frequently during November, December to try to re um, reallocate that money. So when I reached out to um, the committee or I, to Adam Gresham, who was the uh, finance director for the administration? You know, he was uh, by the time by the time the extension happened at the end of December, he was like, you know, "The money's kind of gone," um, or that those particular funds were were just put into a, another disbursement. So, um, so that's basically been the process. I mean, obviously, if we knew back in June, July, September, October, November that that the program could have been extended, like we were hoping. Um, that money wouldn't have been returned at that time. So now we're going to start learning next week about the money that Gus is talking about, the federal funding that was allocated towards, at least towards rental arrears, as we heard about it this morning, a little bit. Um, but we need to find out, number one, what we can use the money for, what the treasury rules are going to be, how do we get the programs that we just, that just expired going again. Um, so that is so we're going to be doing a lot of learning about what we can do with the money that's forthcoming but the money that is gone is um at least to my knowledge is gone uh, mr chairman my understanding is that it still needs to be allocated or reallocated by the with an agreement between the general assembly and the uh, and the administration so i i don't so then know we'll jump on it yeah then we'll jump on it you know, but i I don't think that that debate is over. I think that you, you and your colleagues will hear about other valuable programs uh, where the administration may want to reallocate it, but I, I don't think that it is all gone yet. At least, at least that's my understanding. But well, that would be good. Yeah, that would be something that we'll 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 focus on. Um, yeah, does that is that clear enough, Representative Blumen? I mean, as clear as I can be. <laughs> Um, Representative Parsons. Yeah, thank you for all that information. Uh, I just wanted to tip my cap to you, to the part that you, your, your group played in the uh, another aspect, the Tucker Mountain Forest, which is quite literally my backyard. Um, <laughs> conserving, conser being able to conserve that land for the, the people in this area was fantastic. Um, one question I had, the efficiency modulars, yeah. What, what is the price of one of those? Um, I believe all in with a solar package um, and. Um, you have to have a pad and everything. And, and, and the foundation, the frost wall foundation or whatever it is that's required, you're probably up around $170,000, $180,000. The unit itself is much less expensive than that. But when you add in all the others now, it, from my perspective, there's actually also a Vermont, there's a main company we're doing business with right now. We actually started this effort with a Vermont company. Uh, they were booked out through spring, so we couldn't order from them. These homes are much more comparable to actually a stick built single family thousand square foot home than a mobile home. Uh, you can buy a new mobile home, but it won't be nearly as energy efficient in the and get it installed in the probably eighty ninety thousand dollar range, with all Thank all you. this. Yeah. All right, and Gus, one one last question for me. Um, you said that one hundred and eighty five folks are now housed in in the housing that that was purchased and re and renovated. One of the things, part of the conversation last year was was. My experience when I was on the board at Down Street, when we opened up the new building in Barrie, was that there were four or five units specifically for for families or for individuals who were experiencing homelessness. 
And they required 20 applications in order to fill those, those small numbers because of the, the way that the finances weren't working out for the other, some of the other folks. Um, do you, are you aware of any of the similar difficulties with the, with housing the number of folks that we've housed already or, um, or is that a question for, for the locals? Um, I'm, I'm going to try to answer it, but I, I'm going to also let other people who are with you today add to or subtract from or tell me I'm wrong. Um, we are more and more making use, and Jen presented it in her slides, uh, on the coordinated entry system. Um, there are sometimes people who go through that system and then go to Richard Williams shop to get a voucher that for some reason they're not eligible, but it seems like in most of the state, it's been working better than the experience that you just relayed of it takes five applications to get one person qualified. Um, I don't think we'd be at 185 if it was a five to one ratio today. Um, you know, the continuums of care are locally driven uh, entities, um, some of them are better staffed um, and more professional, and some of them are a little bit more funky and grassroots. Uh, but from my perspective, one of the things that happens in a crisis, and I spent years on the volunteer fire department, is everybody figures out we have a crisis and we got to work together as fast as we can. And I know in Richard's shop, they've been doing just tremendous work turning applications around and moving approvals as almost as quickly as anybody possibly could. So, so I don't think it's as difficult as what you described, but I'm sure that there are parts of the state where it's funkier than others. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, um, Gus and Jen, for that. Um, we will be having, I mean, when we get done with all three, if there's more questions, we will come back to you unless you need to go. And then we will certainly have you back for a larger scale conversation about the work of um, BHCB and what its um, priorities are for, for the coming year beyond the COVID response. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Richard Williams, welcome. Chairman, uh, the gentleman that I am, uh, I would like to offer uh, more to go before me because I, don't know what's going on because I can't see my video. And uh, so I don't think you can see me. We can actually. Yeah, well, that's good because uh, I still offer that to more because I don't know why, why <laughs> I see myself. Not that I want to see myself, but uh, you know, the challenging times on, on Zoom. Uh, so maybe that's better if you can't see me, but uh, so, but I still offer more, more to go before myself. All right, more. Yeah. And suggest, uh, Richard, that you uh, leave the meeting and come back in. That sometimes corrects those sorts of problems. That's what I was going to do, Ron. I thank you that, you know, my IT guy always says, well, if it doesn't work, shut it off and turn it back on again. So that's what I'm going to do. So thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience. It's okay. Thank you for, uh, thank you for, for ceding your time. <laughs> Makes it feel like the Senate the other night. Um, yeah. Um, Representative Co Maura Collins, um, welcome. And I see that you do have your, your uh, well, it's Chad. I'm not sure what his role is here, so. Yes, um, thank you, Richard. Always a gentleman, um, which we call him a gentleman. And Gus referred to him as a king of rental assistance. So all those things. Thank you, committee. My name is Maura Collins, I am the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. Um, it sounds a lot like the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, but we are very different and we're not trying to confuse you with all these Vermont housing acronyms, but um, we may. So uh, we will help you um, uh, uh, see the differences. I did want to introduce my coworker, Chad Simmons. Chad uh, is on day five of working with us. Um, he is our um, housing policy and engagement specialist. And uh, will, if we were in the building, uh, he would be with me and I would be individually introducing him to you all um, as he's going to be integral in our work this session. Um, and so I may follow up with you individually over email just to um, make some connections there. 
Um, so uh, VHFA, the Housing uh, Finance Agency, um, we are a similar to VHCB in the sense that we are a statewide quasi-governmental housing funder of affordable housing. I'll point out some of the ways we stand out and give you a little bit of overview of VHFA, similar to Gus, what Gus did for his organization. And then I'm gonna talk about the mortgage assistance program that this committee supported through the CRF funding. Um, VHFA is unique because we have a large mortgage uh, program that serves, between, depending on the year, between about 10 or 15% of the state's mortgages are actually VHFA mortgages. Um, it's a small, modest market share because we only lend to lower income borrowers, mostly who are first time home buyers. So our, um, our market is really small and narrow. Our average borrower earns just around $60,000 and they usually get a mortgage for about, well, the home that they buy is usually about $165,000. So these are um, modest. For years, we've been talking about um, the need for affordable home ownership and the need to move into affordable homes um, and to own those homes so that uh, young folks have a place to land and, and stay in Vermont, as well as um, other households who may be downsizing and the like. And the reason why the need for affordable uh, home ownership is so critical is that as rents continue to rise year after year, it becomes harder and harder for folks to save up for a down payment that they may need to buy their home. And this is especially true for households led by a person of color. In Vermont, we can see this play out because while the state and the white home ownership rate in Vermont is 72%, so most Vermonters are homeowners, it's only 42% of households led by a person of color uh, will own their home. So nationally, we see the same numbers and we know that these statistics of um, the black and, and person of color household home ownership rates are far below whites. And what we see is that the home ownership rates for people of color are actually below the levels where they were in the late 60s when the Fair Housing Act was passed. And that was when uh, the nation decided that it would finally stop overtly lending based on race. So we know that homeownership is the best way to close the asset gap between white households and people of color, which makes focusing and having conversations around homeownership especially in a rural state like Vermont with such a high homeownership rate overall so critical. Additionally, VHFA uh, works and supports rental housing through issuing bonds. That's why we're separate from the state. We um, issue bonds usually on a tax exempt basis where investors don't have to pay taxes on the interest that they earn. And uh, VHFA holds those on our balance sheet which is separate from the states. So we use that investor money that we've raised by selling those bonds to pay for the mortgages I was just speaking of, and also to make much larger mortgages uh, to the developers of affordable rental housing, most of which are the nonprofit partners that you heard Gus speaking about. And that's why I appreciated that Gus said in so many, I knew Gus is just incredibly eloquent and always has the best presentations of, you know, the pictures of the projects. And I knew he would um, be telling stories of those uh, housing developments. And I really appreciated how he called out um, that often VHFA was a partner on those because often we either um, had a loan on those projects which we can offer those interest rates below the market rate, which helps keep the rents low because if you're paying less on your mortgage, then you um, need less to, as for rent. And the loans that we make can either be short-term construction loans that just last the 12 or 18 months it takes to build a building, 
or it can be 30 year permanent loans um, that help, like I said, keep the rents low by keeping the um, ongoing costs of that building as affordable as possible. Additionally, um, we administer um, a tax credit program. Um, there are federal tax credits. Um, how federal tax credits work is way beyond the scope. I don't think Richard would have ceded that much time to me. It's way beyond uh, what we could cover today. Um, it's probably way beyond what any of you are interested in. Um, but the important thing to know is that federal the federal tax credit program, what I wanna say about it is that it is the largest source of affordable rental housing capital dollars that the, that the federal government um, puts to support housing. So um, Vermont being as innovative as we are uh, in 2000 saw the tremendous success of the tax credit, federal tax credit program that had, was created in the late eighties and it decided to copy it and create a state tax credit program that we administer. Um, and that state tax credit program um, originally funded the creation of rental housing. Um, and then years later, it was expanded to pay for the creation of affordable home ownership homes because there's not a lot of programs that support uh, the creation of starter homes and, and lower priced homes. After Tropical Storm Irene, the program was expanded again. And uh, now there's a statewide effort to purchase old energy inefficient mobile homes and replace them with highly efficient, maybe zero energy modular, maybe um, just energy star rated highly efficient mobile homes. So we're taking um, homes that really are a drag on those homeowners and, and giving them a more affordable option. And finally, um, about five years ago, uh, the legislature um, expanded the uh, state tax credit program to create a down payment assistance program that VHFA administers. And um, that gives us the ability to provide 0% uh, interest loans to first time home buyers who get a VHFA mortgage. And it helps them with that down payment assistance, as I said, which is the primary barrier folks have to moving into home ownership. Um, so it was with that background and knowledge that this committee, knowing um, that VHFA worked a lot with participating lenders in the state, um, who offer VHFA loan programs um, and worked primarily with lower income borrowers that you all uh, chose us to be the administrator of a mortgage assistance program, which I always refer to as MAP. Um, and there was $5 million of CRF, coronavirus relief fund money that went to support um, more mortgaged homeowners who may be at risk of foreclosure because of COVID economic impacts. And I too would also just really like to thank you for the endorsement and support of choosing VHFA to play this role. This is exactly in the sweet spot of our mission. This is why we are here. This is why Vermont has a housing finance agency to step in during times like this, when you need a equitable statewide program to be run and to ensure that it's going to reach the demographics that I know the legislative intent um, aimed to, to hit. I sent Ron a uh, PDF that's up on your website um, that I, I didn't, do the pretty slideshow that um, uh, my peers did, but um, you can see there some information about what happened with our program. Again, we were awarded $5 million, similar to what you've heard, you'll hear from each of us today. It was in um, early November, we started to see that uh, with the timing constraints of having to expend all the money by December 20th, because actually, the state gave us, if you remember, you all gave us a 10 days less to make sure that if we had to shuffle money between the 20th and 30th, we could. So by early November, um, sharing the state's goal of not wanting any dollars to be returned to the feds unused and knowing that there was tremendous need all over the state, 
we returned about $300,000 um, to the state. And so in the end, we spent 4.7 million on this program. We were able to help 645 households. Um, the median income of those households was just over $3,000 a month. So that means that their annual income was about $36,000. So we put an income limit on this program and were able to serve very low income households. Um, I'm very proud of the regional dispersion of um, the, this assistance. Uh, at the bottom of page one, you'll see a link to our website. And that um, was a page that we created uh, in mid-July when the program was first launched, and we would update it every week that we had applications for this program. And so every week, you all, the media, the state could look and see who was applying for this money and, and what the needs were and what the demographics of those being served were. And um, so we, had a, we have a chart there where you could see each county of the state and how many mortgaged homeowners live in each county and compare it to how many applications we were getting from each county. So we could early on see where we were over or under serving homeowners across the state. What we saw early on um, was actually that Rutland County through no reason that I can understand or get to the bottom of, but we slightly underserved Rutland County, Representative Howard. It's important for you to know, I know. And so seeing this back in August, we immediately um, adjusted our marketing budget and um, did some direct targeted um, outreach to Rutland County and tried to really work to get that number up, which we were able to do. Um, I don't, I don't wanna overstate this underserving. It was actually quite modest, but um, we were pleased that we were able to track this kind of information every week and adjust the program accordingly. One of the surprises of running this program um, was, the the length of time that that people were in mortgage arrears, how long they had not been paying their mortgage. Um, it was a requirement, obviously, um, that uh, people prove that they had a COVID related uh, need for this assistance. Um, but over half of the households we served um, had well, let me see, it was about 66% of the households we served owed more than six months of back mortgage payments. And so I remember um, testifying to you all last fall and summer and every other time because your session never ended, it felt like, um, that I kept calling this a mortgage assistance program. And I really was nervous about calling it a foreclosure prevention program because I didn't know who was going to apply. And I didn't know if we would be using this program to give folks one or two months of assistance or if this would really be um, preventing a foreclosure. And since our state has a foreclosure moratorium currently and a lot of federally backed mortgages all are under a foreclosure moratorium, I wanted to be um, clear that technically you can't even start a foreclosure right now. So can we call it a foreclosure prevention program if it's impossible to begin foreclosure proceedings? That didn't feel um, fully transparent. But now that I see who we've assisted, I feel far more confident in saying this was a foreclosure prevention program because if you have a forbearance, first off, only 65% um, of the people we assisted have a forbearance agreement. And a forbearance agreement, if you haven't ever entered into one of these yourself, um, is an agreement where your mortgage lender says, it's okay, you can skip a couple payments um, and we will uh, figure out how you're going to pay us back for that later, but we understand that there is an economic hardship causing you to um, not be able to pay us for a little while. Um, the federally backed mortgages, thankfully, have for the most part dealt with this in a very ethical, humane, respectful way, which is if a mortgage holder has a forbearance and they skip six months of mortgage payments, 
the lender will tack that on to the end of their loan and just extend the term without changing the monthly payment when that forbearance agreement expires. So if my mortgage is due in 2046, now maybe it's gonna be due in 2047. I'll figure that out in 2046. You know, um, it's not going to impact me today or risk my home. Uh, what we worry about is for people, for lenders where they aren't under the same kind of um, federal rules. And instead, when the forbearance period is over, the lender will sometimes, often pre-COVID days, would modify that loan and make a payment plan so that those missed mortgage payments get paid back sooner. Meaning if I've been paying $600 a month for my mortgage, now for the next couple of years, I may have to pay $750 or more. And that may push someone so that their housing is unaffordable and now they're at risk of not keeping up with those mortgage payments and going into foreclosure into the future, even if um, they weren't at risk of foreclosure in this moment. But we know that two thirds of the people we've helped that we we paid for, they owed between six or, or over a year worth of past mortgage um, payments. So there are many examples of borrowers who were in the foreclosure process. And then we have been able to, with this assistance, cure those back um, payments that were owed and get them current so that they will be able to emerge from this crisis in a better, more sustainable position. And so when the foreclosure moratorium lifts, which I have no advanced knowledge of when that's gonna happen because that's up to the governor, but when that happens, um, we those households, those 645 households will be in a much more stable, secure position as a result of the program that you all created. Um, so uh, there were, um, those of you who are used to having me testify um, will know that um, not only do I love data, not only do I always ground everything in numbers because I get nervous about hearing anecdotes and acting as a result of them, but I like to ground myself in numbers. And um, similarly, I feel like it's only fair for anyone administering public funds to hold themselves accountable and reflect on their experiences of administering a program, even if it's just a six month program like this was. And so um, there were several lessons learned um, that VHFA uh, has reflected on. We were very proud of the fact that we translated our application guides um, into nine different languages. Um, I want to be the first one to admit that VHFA has not done what it needs to programmatically with VHFA's programs um, around language translation. And that's an active task that we are looking at this year to turn more of our regular mortgage lending program guides um, into uh, various languages. Not having a lot of experience having done this we invested to translate um, our information into nine different languages. And in the end, those guides were downloaded over a hundred times by unique users. And so that tells me that that investment is worth it, that we, that's one of the reasons we were probably able to serve a more diverse, um, uh, lower income and um, higher, uh, larger family size population and, um, so that was one thing. We also worked in partnership with the state's homeownership centers, um, most of which are administered through the nonprofits that uh, Gus pointed out on that map. There are homeownership centers around the state that serve every corner of the state. And partnering with uh, those um, organizations helped us make sure that we were reaching uh, folks who um, had been through their pre-purchase education programs in the past and also gave us a local contact. So if someone needed help filling out an application, needed a paper form, needed computer access to apply, anything like that, there was an organization that we um, were financially supporting in order to make sure that those needs were met. We did the same thing with uh, Vermont Legal Aid with AAL, uh, 
yeah, AALV, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, as well as uh, Vermont Center for Independent Living, who works with people with disabilities. There are, in, in wrap up, I'll say there were a few policy lessons that we learned um, that I wanted to share with you all. And the first, I think I've, I hope I've um, delivered, which is that this committee supporting the creation of this program and and um, creating it the way you did really was able to stabilize hundreds of Vermont homeowners and prevent homelessness and foreclosure for so many Vermonters across the state. This served a um, low income population. And as I said, it was a more um, racially diverse, um, larger household size, and uh, more likely to be disabled than the general population. So we really served um, a, a part of the, our community that has been hard hit by uh, COVID and I hope you all are proud of that. Looking toward the future, I know the, if it's not the first question that's asked, it'll be someone's question today, which will be, do we need to continue this kind of program into the future? And I will say yes. I do believe that there will be ongoing needs. I think that the economic fallout of um, the coronavirus, uh, I, I can't see the end in sight. I'm, I'm told there's a vaccine, you know, that will get to us all, but the economic impacts are very different than um, things like vaccines and treatments and all that. Um, I cannot stand in front of you though and estimate what the level of that need would be. So I am not here with a specific ask. In fact, if you remember, I wanna call myself out on the fact that I was wrong in my estimates of how much assistance I thought would be delivered. Um, there were our 45,000 low-income Vermonters who have mortgages. And I was thinking, well, if only 10% of them applied for this program, that'd be 4,500 applicants. I mean, I did not think that the 5 million that was being allocated was going to be enough and it ended up it was enough. So what happened? I think it's those forbearance agreements and it's the national um, Freddie and Fannie backed mortgages as well as um, some other government backed mortgages have blanket said, okay, for our loans, which is, um, uh, the majority of loans nationally and in Vermont, um, folks don't have to make mortgage payments for six months. And if six months isn't enough, they can ask for longer, up to 12 months of skipped mortgage payments. And so if that's the case, that is really working and that's working well. What I, what I don't know and I wish I had data on is how many of those forbearance agreements are going to lead to modified loan terms where the payment goes up for those homeowners and they then are in a worse situation for affording their home and how many are just going to extend the loan term and maybe that will be enough and be okay. That's why I, I'm not here to say I need X number of millions of dollars to continue this program. I will say that there are, um, conversations next week when we talk about um, the rental assistance that the stimulus program has provided for the state. I have to say, um, if you ask Maura her opinion, I, I really wish some of that was for mortgage assistance so that we could stand up a program modeled after what we've done and just have some money available um, for households because every time we set some kind of deadline on the program that we administered over the last six months, we saw that the demand went way up right as we hit the deadline. We had lots of phone calls for the two weeks after the program closed saying, I didn't know about it. You know, can I still apply? Can I still get in? And the, the time pressure of wrapping everything up by December 20th meant that we had to close the doors, but that does not mean that we closed the doors because the need was met. Um, so I guess that wraps up the high points I wanted to cover, and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I just want to, before we go to Representative Kalaki Mora, I just want to point out that, or reiterate that this program was open to all uh, mortgage uh, mortgagors, that this wasn't simply people who had taken a mortgage through VHFA. Is that, that's what we set out to do, correct? 
That it, yes, thank you for clarifying that. Um, the uh, yes, this was to all um, mortgagors. You, the statute did say that we had to set an income limit. And so we did set an income limit as a way of um, protecting the resources and serving those who are most in need. Um, but we actually adjusted that income limit as the program went on. But you're exactly right, Representative. And that is um, that was one of the internal growing pains that VHFA had was we were now working with a much larger universe of loan servicers across the country than we traditionally had uh, worked with with VHFA's programs. And um, it sometimes took a long time to make initial contact with servicers in lots of different places of the world uh, and to get a contact there because the mortgage assistance program uh, did not send money directly to the homeowner, but instead sent money um, directly to the mortgage servicer. The other point, if I may, before we go to a question, I'm realizing um, I didn't clarify was that this program, because your mortgage payment often includes escrowed property taxes, we were able to help people um, with their property taxes because it was a part of that mortgage payment. Uh, soon after launching the program, we learned that we were unintentionally leaving out um, mortgaged homeowners who did not, who chose not to escrow their taxes. If they were falling behind on their taxes, because it wasn't a part of that mortgage payment, we didn't have a way of helping them. So we quickly um, fixed that internal problem and um, were able to provide property tax relief to homeowners who had mortgages um, by paying. And we were able to stop several tax sales as a result of that, which could have led to the homeowner losing their home. And that was something that came, as you said, came up after we left and after we were finished and um, you reached out to uh, Senator Sorokin and I anyway, and then the administration, and we were able to adjust it so that the rules allowed that. Um, the flexibility in the rulemaking was enough to, to allow that to happen. Which is a great plug for a precursor to the conversations we'll be having um, about the, the future rental assistance that will be available in Vermont that to the extent that the statute can be clear about the goals you would like us to achieve with affordable housing when you're working with long-standing partners like VHFA, VHCB, DHCD, and the State Housing Authority, you can trust us that we will adjust and modify programs to meet the needs of um, the residents that we see. And sometimes it is easier to be a little lighter on those details so that we can learn from experience um, and adjust accordingly. And then again, come back to you with the data to explain to you exactly why we made the choices we did and, and to hold us accountable through that way. I'm not trying to say write us blank checks. I'm just trying to put in a plug that there were so many lessons learned that none of us could have anticipated by rolling out, what's the total housing assistance, like $85 million within six months. I mean, I'm sorry, but the flexibility was critical, and I know that it was appreciated by all of us. Great. Representative Kalaki, thank you for your patience. Sure, and hello, Maura. Thank you for coming, and welcome to Chad. Um, you, you know, your success is breathtaking. Uh, because as we checked in along the way, you were, you were like saying, I don't know if we're going to make this. And then when you, when you kept shifting uh, your responsiveness and the results are amazing. But to me, it, it, it really shows a problem that was pre-COVID as well. That if, if these mortgages were in a, six months before and now this money is used up and post covid not going to begin till at least summer. And so the next six months, the economy is going to still be stalled at best, that we're, we're going to go back to the whole problem that you've just, you know, did a remarkable job, but it's almost like you, you stopped the leak here, but then, you know, you know, it's like, how are we going to do this? And so as you look ahead, um, this must be a very daunting issue of both in rental arrears that we're not talking about today, but in foreclosures, like this money has now ended. COVID has not ended. Poverty has not ended. And jobs aren't 
coming back. And so this precipice that you, you showed us here, which is amazing, 648 homeowners, uh, you helped with you know, just $4.7 million, but the precipice is enormous now from six months from now. Well, thank you. And I um, absolutely agree with you. I had the um, honor of serving on the governor's um, economic mitigation task force, whatever that was called. Um, and it um, we did surveys of thousands of Vermonters and, and wrote some reports and recommendations to the governor as a result of that, because the the part of the task force I was focused on was um, local solutions and community action or community response, something like that. Um, and that is exactly what we found across this, um, what, what's been happening over the past year, which is that there, there are new challenges, but it's really just shining a light on the, the chronic challenges that we have long known exist in our state and um, are only getting more difficult. You know, the, the problems that there are with not having uh, affordable housing and, and the capital, the stock of housing that Gus was talking about. The lack of broadband is now a much bigger highlighted issue. Uh, limited childcare, um, limited opportunities um, for parents to have flexibility with their time and all. Um, you, you're exactly right. Um, and so, it is difficult situation to be in, to feel good about what we have been able to accomplish, but to know that um, we were only to able to help people through their December mortgage payment. So come January 1st, I, I do believe it's very possible there were 600 households who then were faced with the same scenario of what do they do now. Um, I don't know if you all saw the second update that we gave to the state. I Well, to those of you who were on the committee, I remember um, sharing this in September testimony with you, but to the new members of the committee, um, I shared probably a dozen single sentences that um, we pulled out of just a handful of the applications for this assistance, um, talking about why they needed it. And, and when you hear these reasons why they need the assistance, I can't imagine these reasons have gone away in the last um, couple months. Meaning like before the pandemic, I was a hairstylist at a nursing home, but now I'm prohibited from entering the building and was unable to pay my bills with unemployment. Another one, we're cruise planners. All the bookings have been canceled or postponed. There's no way for predicting when travel will pick up again. We hope soon, but we're actively, um, you know, we're still planning uh, when client confidence is improved. Um, there's another one, due to COVID-19, my children are home 24 seven, increasing my home expenses for power, heat and food. Um, and it, it continues on, um, uh, I'm not able to work through my sole proprietorship. I've been told to stay at home due to recovering from cancer and have high blood pressure, borderline diabetic. I'm over 70 years old and have lung disease. I mean. These problems have not gone away because our program has ended. These, these homeowners are still diabetic and 70 years old and, and facing these challenges. And so and it, it, is the foreclosure moratorium ongoing still, both federally and state? So and is there a deadline that's been extended on yep. that? Or where are we with this? Yep. The, um, the national... Um, eviction moratorium goes through the end of this month. So far, our state moratorium continues to um, keep reaching out farther than the national ones do. So I, I pay more attention to the state one. Um, and so um, it, and it but will be- But these Freddie Mac mor mortgages and stuff. Well, That's so the, yeah, the, so the, for the moratorium, meaning you can't begin eviction proceedings, um, it is, you know, 30 days after the state of emergency expires, which, as you know, keeps getting extended by the governor. The, um, those forbearance allowances of Fannie and Freddie, um, they are still in effect. And I need to double check how much longer, what the, what the farthest out date is. I have to tell you, it gets really complicated really quickly because um, we don't know whose mortgages are backed by who, Freddie or Fannie, and if there's other government backings like um, the VA and the rest. And so um, it, 
it, you have to kind of pull all these things together into one place. And I get a little um, light on the details and I have to ask others for help with that. Okay, well, thanks. I, first, thank you for everything your staff has done. It really is extraordinary. Deeply appreciate it. They are an amazing team. And now we have Chad to join it. He's part of that amazing team. All right, we have a question from Representative Trino and I just wanna finish up so we can get to Richard. Um, so that he can fill us in on the rental arrearage program, which was um, um, which was an over twenty million dollar program, as well. So, yeah, Representative Trino, go ahead. I just wanted to say um, the property tax thing was a great catch, Maura. Um, You know, when we were um, uh, giving, uh, when we were uh, 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 allocating this money to uh, uh, mortgage um, protection. I kept saying, um, you know, if you can't pay your mortgage, you can't pay your property taxes and you can still lose your property. So um, that was a great catch. And, um, and I will say again to you, it's a great job. We very much appreciate the work that you do and, and uh, we're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Maura. And um, welcome, Chad. I'm sure we'll connect with you soon enough. Um, but Maura, thank you again for all that you've done to try to um, help us set up the program, help us understand the federal programming that's, that, that was happening and really um, having the outside parameters that, you know, the, was integral and even, uh, we, yes, we thought 5 million wasn't going to be enough um, back, in, back in May and June, but it turned out to be okay. And I think part of our job next week, starting next week, will be um, seeing seen as you asked if we can make that money work for mortgages as well as for other um, rental stuff so we'll we'll we're, we don't want to ignore mortgages um, it's the same attitude that we'll have towards the rental arrearage program that Richard is going to tell us about so thank you so much for coming in and we'll see you soon thank you um, Richard can you see us Chairman, I apologize for that. Uh, uh, if everything else fails, reboot your system and it seems to work. So uh, my apologies for that. But uh, uh, I knew Maura was all teared up and ready to go. And uh, so I knew she could cover for me. But that's kind of a scary thing if you can't be, if you don't think that you're being seen and you actually are. So uh, got to gotta work on that little problem, I guess. So anyway, uh, I want to Welcome the new members to the committee and welcome back uh, previous members of this committee. Uh, I know it was, I think in September, I met with some of you folks. It seems like only yesterday, um, the way our world has been working since, uh, since June and the Zoom meetings that we're all been uh, patiently uh, participating in. Um, here we go again. So, uh, Thank you. Uh, just want a, a little background for the new members, uh, the Rot Lot Legislature. It was actually Bill H 966, uh, which related to the COVID 19 funding, uh, provided assistance for broadband connectivity, housing, economic relief. And that was actually signed into law on, by Governor Scott on July 2nd. Uh, 11 days after, July 2nd on, on the 13th, Vermont State Housing Authority launched uh, its program on behalf of tenants in need of rental rearage assistance uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I'm gonna use RHSP because it stands for Rental Housing Stabilization Program, it's just easier to say for me. Uh, provided rental rearage to landlords for the actual amount owed by the tenant or we had set some, some limits. Uh, Vermont State Housing Authority payment standards is a uh, terminology used in a HUD federal program, HUD Housing Urban Development, the uh, Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program. Uh, we adopted those payment standards for this program. We used whichever was less, um, what the tenant owed or, uh, the, uh, or the actual payment standard. The primary goal of this program was to keep Vermonters housed during this public health emergency. Uh, and I know you've heard uh, Chairman Stevens uh, talk about, you know, housing and healthcare, uh, they go hand in hand. Uh, 
The primary goal was to, to keep folks housed by allowing them to keep their rented homes, by granting back rent funds and avoiding terminations of tenancy, court evictions and homelessness. The second goal was to compensate landlords for some of their losses due to the CARES Act, judicial emergencies and stay of eviction proceedings. Applications were processed on a first come first serve basis there were no uh, threshold uh, to apply was low. Uh, this was to allow anybody that was experiencing a rental assistance problem to participate. I know there was originally some concerns that you know high income uh, individuals might be applying for the program. Uh, that's not what we saw. Uh, and some of those high income households lost their jobs in the last six or seven months and uh, needed some help. So yes, some money may have gone to some higher income uh, households, but it, you know, it was needed uh, to stabilize their housing. So the, the program has been active for a little over six months. Um, and uh, we have, we will spend all our allocation. Uh, we received $25 million uh, for this program. And at the end of October, uh, because we were required to analyze if we thought we were going to have any uh, monies of the, uh, left that wasn't going to be spent because the administration needed time to uh, have these monies returned and reallocated. Based on the applications that we were seeing at the end of October, it appeared like there was gonna be an excess amount of appropriation left over. Uh, through the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, through the Department of Housing and uh, Community Development, uh, we returned $3 million to the state of Vermont. What happened after that was the applications increased substantially. Uh, we're now in a situation of not having enough funds to fund our program. We believe we're going to be at least two and a half million dollars short. And there, that will leave 1500 applications on the table that won't be funded. Some folks have suggested that we try to put this money into the new program. We can talk about that. But I can tell you the eligibility uh, will be much different for the monies that Vermont will receive in fiscal year uh, or in calendar year 2021. So as Gus had mentioned, I believe there is some money that has needs to still be negotiated, I think with joint uh, fiscal. Uh, and uh, we would certainly hope to try to get that money back uh, because I think Folks right now with these applications need the assistance uh, and not sure when the new money would be available, uh, but I'm thinking that's potentially late spring, uh, not late spring, but late winter, early spring. Uh, I think Vermont will have the money, but the time we need to stand up a new program and uh, may slow down the applications. What, what our numbers do prove is that many tenants have not been able to pay their rent during this current public housing uh, health crisis and the landlords are on the edge of losing their investments and their livelihood. I just wanna the, also this program underline the continued need for affordable housing for all Vermonters. And that's importance of working with landlords, large and small, for, for profit and nonprofit to stabilize the diverse housing stock needed for healthy, healthy community. One thing we learned, and I've been here 47 years, I've saw more people uh, living in different types of rental situations that I didn't even know existed in the state of Vermont. How many people are actually renting motel rooms uh, or hotel, you know, around the state of Vermont, and that's their that's their source of housing. It, it's uh, people renting rooms out to folks in their, either in their own homes or in their own apartments. Uh, it's, it was just an eye opener to see 
how creative people were, but at also uh, living in situations that I don't think that we would really like to see them living in. In the second half of our program, we really stepped up the outreach, and that may be another reason uh, why the applications uh, increased. But uh, you know, we used we uh, used digital ads, basically. You know, the the, the radio stations, the you know, and the local newspapers, and working through community and employer-based newsletters, uh, and also the live radio spots, um, really to get the word out. And uh, working with our, you know, community partners, I believe that's um, what may have uh, increased the applications. But what also happened is when we announced that we were closing our program on December 11th, uh, because all at, at this time we knew we had to process this money through by the end of December. So that, and then of course, you know, everything changed right after Christmas when the president finally decided to sign the budget, which extended the program, uh, the program that we're currently in administering to December of 31st of 2021. Had we only had this knowledge, you know, months earlier and knowing that we could spend more money, we could probably, have spent a lot more money than we have. And uh, so the last 10 days before we closed the program, we received 3,500 submissions. So again, I think this demonstrates the need for this program, for a continued program. And uh, we always tried to expedite the applications to get the assistance out as, as quickly as possible. We also um, created a couple of new programs uh, in the last few months of, the, of this. So actually there was a money to boo program, which paid, uh, we set up, which paid the first month's rent security deposit last month where necessary. And uh, we could provide rental payments through December to help families move into sustainable housing. And, and that was probably over a million dollars that we uh, actually spent on that particular program. We also came up with a program to help landlords a little bit with vacancy loss uh, because they had units that were vacant, they couldn't rent them, they didn't have money enough to fix the repairs. So we created a vacancy loss program for landlords who tenants moved out unexpectedly or were forced to absorb the cost of the running unit due to the unforeseen vacancy and sometimes tenant damage. But what had happened a lot of times that we saw was uh, the tenant might have moved out before the application was processed, but the landlord had applied for the money. So this, this was a way to try to help the landlord out a little bit by paying for the vacancy loss. We also worked very closely uh, with uh, Vermont Legal Aid, uh, Vermont Landlords Association, and other attorneys in the state. And we were able to uh, set up a program uh, to help settle back rent disputes out of court. Uh, otherwise, it would lead to eviction. The, uh, so we entered into stipulation agreements with, uh, uh, between the parties, the landlords and tenants. And uh, that was a successful program. We also used a, uh, a statute 12 BSA 4773, which provides a renter a way to have a non-payment eviction case discontinued if the renter pays into court, all rent due through the end of that current rental period, including interest and in the cost of the suit. Uh, we made these payments to the trust counts at Vermont Legal Aid or Legal Services of Vermont and uh, they get, they were using those organizations, that money uh, made it into the courts and therefore stopping that particular eviction. This can, uh, under the statute that allows, uh, that basically allows uh, tenants to uh, bring up their rearage at that time to, uh, to stop the eviction. So sometimes, you know, we see tenants, you know, the family members or their mothers or other family members or fathers, you know, will provide them some money to, to pay off the rent to, to stop the eviction case. And, uh, that was successful. Mediation services were developed 
in and ministered to the Vermont Landlords Association. And what they did is they worked to settle disputes between the tenants and landlords without the involvement of the court system uh, that uh, they had access money to pay back rent it, uh, and uh, it allowed to, to maintain a stable uh, tenancy. Uh, we had several, several landlords and tenants take, take a, uh, go through that process, that service uh, that was helpful. And with this program, we were there uh, to settle it with the money. So as we enter the end of this program, uh, my grant agreement actually uh, ends on uh, January 15th. Uh, the uh, department has, has, uh, has applied, uh, will give us additional 90 days, but all the money will be spent next Friday. Uh, we do AC, ACH uh, deposits. Uh, we don't write checks. All that money will be going out of here next Friday, which is uh, about $1.9 million into landlords' uh, direct accounts. And then, uh, as I said, we'll be out of money. And there's still 1,500 applications that we will be processing. Uh, so we had several different, uh, we also, I, I guess I didn't touch on that, you know, the group one, uh, as we referred to them, was where landlords were you know, willing to accept uh, the payment in exchange for not evicting uh, a tenant uh, for the same amount of period of time that they received for the period of time that they received money from the, out of this program. Uh, over $16 million went into that. Uh, and the group two was, this is what I don't know, sometimes I think it was referred to in testimony as recalcitrant tenants that landlords could not get the, the tenant to participate. This, uh, this uh, allowed the, the landlord to receive some rent arrearages, uh, but still retain the right uh, to continue eviction when that moratorium is, is eventually lifted. I uh, sent uh, Ron some uh, some uh, uh, basically the, a, a report of this uh, that you can take a look online. I also included a uh, rental housing uh, stabilization landlord survey that we only put it up on, uh, I think Wednesday. And as of today, we have 533 uh, responses to that. But some of that information was, uh, was interesting to take a look at now. This is based on responses that we're getting, but uh, what was surprising way was uh, what uh, we'd asked to best describe uh, what, what type of landlord they were. And so we asked if you're a nonprofit landlord or a private or a public housing authority. Uh, but the majority of the people that responded uh, was 93% over 93% were private landlords, which amazed me, I agreed, this is only 533, we sent out 1600. So you, so we got about 25% response. So that's not bad in about two and a half days. So 93% were actually uh, private landlords or property managers that responded to our survey, about five point, little over 5% were nonprofits. Uh, as I mentioned, housing authorities were eligible to apply for rent arrears. That was about one and a half percent. The other surprising response was me is we asked uh, how many housing units do they do they own or manage? And 49% of them responded that it was between one and four apartments or one and four units. Uh, another 15% was between five to 10 units. So that's... Uh, you know, almost 65% of the folks, you know, were between one and 10 units that they had. Now, I, I expected that we would see a greater response from the, the larger number of units because as we knew there was large landlords were participating in the program. There was nonprofits with a lot of units were participating in the program. So uh, what that tells me is that uh, at least so far with this response is that we reached the private landlord we reached the small private landlord. Uh, and that's good for this type of program because, you know, honestly, folks, folks were really uh, 
in need of this type of assistance. And so the, uh, another question we asked was, how many of the rental uh, unit households have used a rental housing stabilization program? And the answer was about uh, of these responses, 53% have used this program. An additional, uh, approximately 16% uh, also uh, answered this. So a lot of these were just single units that applied for this. So, Richard, um, we have a question from Representative Kalecki. Uh, Thank you, Richard. And, and the numbers are, are again astounding. And the twenty, almost twenty million dollars, ninety three hundred Vermonters. Um, I, did you find, as Maura did, about with how far back did the uh, rental arrearages go? And, and what what did you? I I know the average was like two thousand dollars per payment, but what was your experience in this? Well, the uh, again, the flexibility of this program uh, did because this was a uh, a health issue to prevent homelessness. We were fortunate there was no time. We didn't. Uh, we were able to go back prior to March first, and uh, as. As Chairman Stevens says, he had heard 18 months. Uh, I saw some that actually went back before that. So what that tells me is, is, is I think it came out in the testimony, is that pre-COVID, people were struggling to pay their rent here in Vermont. And landlords have uh, surprisingly have not taken action against their tenants uh, you know, through an eviction process to, uh, and that, that, that was another amazing, uh, uh, piece of information that we learned at how, yeah, and again, we were able to, to help some of those landlords clear the, clear up those, uh, uh, severe arrearages. Okay. And so looking forward, like, what do you imagine the program should be? Regarding the, uh, the new $200 million that the state of Vermont is going to receive, is, is that what we're talking about? Uh, well, I, I think yes on the short term, but I think also as more the more holistic thing, like we've, we've now see there's a, a, a paradigm shift in all of this that the that was there before COVID and we, it's just illuminated the problem. And so not only do, how do we, take the first step with the 200 million, but longer term, how does Vermont begin to rethink keeping people housed? Well, this is just kind of off the top of the head and I think it's been presented in this committee before uh, there has been studies by Vermont Legal Aid. And um, that study basically was demonstrated that the, uh, the amount of rearage um, that was associated with eviction was just about the amount of money that we paid on yeah. average for rental rearage. So a lot of those evictions, people were losing their housing for, you know, $2,000. Uh, so I think that suggests that there might be some type of program going forward to try to continue to stabilize, you know, uh, families, uh, the need, uh, you shouldn't. Okay. You shouldn't Thank lose you. your housing over two thousand dollars, in my opinion. I appreciate that. Thank you, and appreciate and your work. A, and that's a report that we can post again. Um, that was done by Legal Aid and uh, the Vermont Landlords Association. And and again, the difference there was, um, you know, if you could solve the problem for two thousand dollars rather than the seventy five hundred to ten thousand dollars of legal fees okay. that it costs without that, um, why wouldn't we? Um, you know, and we, we fought hard for some funding in 2019 and we were on our road to fighting, a, you know, a really uphill battle to try to get it funded, uh, in 2020 before COVID. And so it's just something to, it's something to, um, again, once this is all done, Richard, um, well, I have three, I have three questions lined up here. Um, 
my question quickly will be, can you, is there any way to delineate with the 1500 people who are left um, and they're not left, but the 1500 people whose applications you can't fund right now because of the money that you gave back um, about what you may know about what the ch changes in qualifications are going to be and those who may not be able to, can, do you have those numbers yet or? We're, we're still working on that, but I, I can tell you that uh, it, the eligibility uh, for the families would definitely be different. It will definitely have to serve households uh, below 80% of income, area medium, excuse me. Uh, and there will be a preference for serving uh, individuals at 50% of area medium. There will also be, uh, which we, you know, the uh, Department of Housing Community Development are preparing a lot of questions to be submitted to Treasury. And a lot of us had input into some of those questions because reading the act, they use terminology that's not clear. Uh, and of course, right now, the challenge for the state of Vermont is that you're working with uh, a current administration that's going to, you know, be leaving uh, office in 12 days and a new treasury coming on, uh, a treasurer coming on on January 20th. Um, will there be some additional flexibility uh, with a new administration? Yet to know, but you st they still have the act. And so you gotta, you know, whatever the, the act is, it creates the guardrails and yep. uh, entities will have to, you know, drive between those guardrails. So, yep. um, so the, the, there will be definitely uh, other tests uh, and uh, it has to be experienced or at risk of experiencing homelessness, uh, you know, so what, yep. what some of those definitions mean. So we have a lot to work out, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and a lot of questions. My concern personally, it's going to slow the application process down because if we have to do, you know, means testing, and we weren't doing means testing, as I said, with our current program, uh, our uh, internet, uh, you know, email that we have set up for this particular program and our call center we have is being flooded with inquiries already from tenants and landlords saying, is this program going to be continued? And how soon can you get the money to us? Mm -hmm. uh, the, some of the challenges that we had with our current program is that uh, landlords and tenants could reapply. So what was happening towards the end uh, is that we were getting applicants. As soon as the first of the month passed, we got an application for rental assistance. So that, that, uh, that added uh, additional workload for the staff and stress mm -hmm. in order to, to try to get those applications out. There appears to be, at least with the new, what they're calling the new emergency rental assistance, uh, there appears to be uh, that we can do reoccurring payments uh, and may be able to enter into longer term agreements, uh, 12 months uh, up to, or an additional three months uh, if housing stability is necessary. That was one of those things that we need to understand what that means. But if we can enter into our longer term agreement, it'd be like providing rental assistance. We can yeah. do that on a monthly basis. Once it's loaded in the vendors, that's not a challenge. But uh, I think there will be um, additional requirements to, to look at the situation to make sure that the, the application uh, there's been some, some cause in their household that uh, requires them to apply for this, this rental assistance where there wasn't under the old program. So, you know, there are gonna be more questions obviously asked of the applicants. Yeah. All right, I have three questions and I just am conscious of the time. It's 3.24, I wanna um, make sure we finish up as soon as we can. Um, Representative Howard, then Hango, then Triano. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Williams, for your testimony. Um, the rental payments, were they sent directly to the tenant 
or to the landlord? This particular program, they, it went to the uh, landlord. It did go directly to the landlord. Okay, thank you, because I've had questions about uh, what if the tenant receives the funding and doesn't put it towards um, their rent, you know, then what recourse does the landlord have? So um, thank you. Just to follow up that on the new uh, money. So it uh, landlord can apply uh, and has to, see what currently what we did is we had two applications, one the tenant and one from the landlord. And, and basically we were asking the, the tenant information that they may not have wanted to share with their landlord. We were asking, what is the condition of your unit? Are there health and safety? You know, there was a long list of questions. And sometimes, mm. you know, honestly, tenants didn't know what was a life safety issue or what violated Vermont Rental Housing Code. Uh, but they had checked it off. But what that did allow us to do is to go and verify that. Working with our partners, Vermont Legal Aid, uh, did a lot of that follow up with the tenants to make sure. Uh, and, you know, my own staff and whatever, you know, followed up and, and just to drill down to see what it, a lot, a lot, sometimes it wasn't, uh, but sometimes there were code violations. Mm -hmm. so we were able to work to get those code violations fixed before we released any money. So that actually, you know, the benefit side benefit of that was, you know, housing got improved here. Yes. So, but the new program is going to allow the one application from the, uh, from the landlord and the tenant, they both have to sign it. But if the landlord doesn't want to participate, the tenant can apply. And unless Vermont, unless the legislature, you know, adds on a condition, and I don't know if we're, again, we don't know if that can be done or not, then the, the money would go directly to the tenant. I see. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Representative Hango. My question is probably directed for you, Mr. Chair, and maybe at a better time since we are running out of time, but it, <clears throat> excuse me, it just has to do with the um, shortfall and how to go about getting the money from the, if there is any still left from the J joint, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the legislative um, committee on joint fiscal matters. Uh, I think what I'll do this weekend is send an email out to uh, the chair of appropriations um, and to and to house leadership to at least advise them that that this is an issue and um, uh, and figure out how to reach out to the administration, what the best way to reach out to the administration is. Because again, I, I got a response to, you know, between Christmas and New Year's that, oh, that money's gone. The BHCB money's gone. Sorry, we're really good at spending it. And, you know, it was done in good, good spirits, but it was um, something that, again, uh, Gus just reported that that may not be completely accurate, that they may just, it just may still be part of the, the bigger pot. So, um, we're going to track it down if we can, because obviously with 1,500 people, uh, not only different qualifications, but just a different system um, is going to delay that payment. I, I mean, I don't have any doubt that we could use the numbers to help, but I'd like to see, I think we'd all like to see that, you know, that money be spent in the way that um, it was intended. Again, this is a problem with not having the program extended four months ago. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Mr. Chairman, you know, that is households. So we know households are greater than one. So this affects a lot of people, uh, you know, and I, 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 I think one of the representatives mentioned, you know, priority for children and families, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of families out there. So yeah, that 1500 represents a lot of, a lot of Vermonters. Thank you for that clarification. I will, um, use that that language when I contact um, the, the folks above me. Representative Trano. Yes, I'll try and be brief uh, because I have to uh, go as well. But um, I, I heard it, it may have been from Angela or Wendy um, about uh, some difficulties landlords were having getting, um, and I think you in part answered this, Richard, um, getting them to um, complete their own application. Um, I had one landlord in my district who was not on speaking terms with his tenant um, and was kind of uh, unable to uh, 
uh, do this dual op application process. Now, maybe one application with both signatories on it will um, assist that, but um, I, I do believe that it was a problem, maybe larger than some of us thought, I think it was. Representative, if I could just quickly respond, and, and that's what the group two, uh, as we keep referring to, is was to help those, uh, those landlords that could not get a tenant uh, to apply. Uh, but what it did is it didn't, it didn't help, you know, it didn't cover it all, but it gave them some, some financial relief. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Richard. And I, and I think what came up as the, as the fall progressed, and I do not want to underestimate, we will hear from legal aid and from the Vermont Landlord Association as well, because again, uh, one of the, one of the proudest moments of, of my time here was watching how well they sat across the table from each other last year and helped us shape this testimony. I don't think I would have expected that from, from the advocates for the landlords and the advocates for the tenants to work together quite the way that the, quite the way that they did to the point where they do have this mediation program set up that, that came online fairly late in the year. But um, once people started hearing about it, people were, um, people were subscribing to it. And what a, what, a, what a potential tool to use, especially during the time of the rental moratoriums. And, you know, it, it, and, and for the amount of emails that I've received, from other legislators who say, well, their neighbor is a landlord and they're having a problem with their tenants. I mean, the numbers are still small. And that doesn't mean that the problems aren't real, but that, that um, the number of people that this program helped uh, again and again throughout the course of this year so far is just, is just astounding to me. And again, grateful to have received the money from the federal government to fund such a program. Um, Grateful to see that it works, Richard, so that we know moving forward that if we do ask ourselves to fund a, a, an arrearage program when this is all over and we're no longer receiving federal funding, that we have the data to back up what was proposed in 2019. And that is that is something that um, structurally, I'm hoping that that's the difference that this pandemic makes um, Mr. Chairman, for if I us. We did two quotes. Uh... As from our survey, as I said, we sent out 650 uh, to unique landlords and we received uh, uh, 410 comments of, from landlords that are willing to share their name on their comments. But two of the comments was, the first was, the program was very helpful to good quality tenants who lost their jobs due to COVID-19. My margins as a landlord are small, so every rent check matters. Since the state is not allowing evictions for non-payment of rent, this helps to keep tenants current with rents seem critical. The other comment was, this program has been a lifesaver for my tenants and myself. It has made it so that tenants are current with rent and has allowed us to stay current with our bills. Having the tenants current with the rent means that no matter what happens in the next few months, I will be able to help them get, or get through until they receive their taxes back and they will not have to worry about having a roof over their heads. I think that says it all. Thank you for my uh, allowing me to testify today. And thank, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Maura, Jen, uh, and Gus, and Chad for coming in today. Um, we will be talking more about this pro these programs and uh, what the future holds and understanding what, um, what's on tap with this $200 million. So committee, just we will probably post next week's agenda as early as Sunday, perhaps not until Monday, Ron and I are still working on the schedule for this week. And then, you know, Chip, when, when things start getting underway, you know, we'll be setting up the, the agenda for the week. Um, as, as we're rolling around again, things are different than they would be if we were in the building. So, um, but this will be a priority next week. I believe we're scheduling in uh, both Senator Leahy's office and the Joint Fiscal office to try to get an understanding of of what we've been talking about today um again i will send an email out to leadership and if i hear back on anything about what the process would be for the for the um both the 1.35 and the 3 million that uh we're talking about then i'll share that with the committee when when i hear back um more good for you to have a thirty six thousand dollar um uh little Bone, uh, plus side at the end of your program, but we're, we're, we, this is 
this is part of our focus, primary focus for the first month of the session, I think is getting, not just getting an idea of what's going on, but how we can best get this $200 million out into our, um, in our case, to, to people who need a place to live. Um, and I'm sure that the other committees will have the same pressures, um, the same ones that we saw throughout the fall. So with that, um, Ron, I'll stay on the line for a couple of minutes. We can we can go off live when when we're done here. Everybody, thank you for the first week, everybody. Thank you wow, much. first week is done. Seventeen to go. Um, uh, Mara, I think <laughs> wants to chair. Mara, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just would hate for people to think that VHFA was not deploying that last $30,000. It's not a lot of money, but we got approval yesterday from the state that we can go back and pay a couple more mortgage payments with it. So that money will be deployed in the next week or so. So I just didn't want anyone to think that that um, was extra in any way. Uh, I'm, yes, thank you. And, and again, uh, if we were to turn the clock back just a wee bit, just so that we could have gotten that extension earlier, then you know I think we all would have seen all of the programs that we're working that we worked on last year, um, kind of make it into the new year differently than than what happened. So um, onwards and upwards, everybody, make sure you get some rest if you haven't gotten the idea after three days of being online, uh, four days is even more exhausting sitting around. Um, I, as you can see, I stood up after, you know, sitting all day long. I just finally had to stand and um, get some rest. Uh, if you are so inclined to do more reading, um, you can certainly go back and maybe Ron can help you if you text him or email him. But if you go back to the previous biennium, uh, which you can easily do on from our from our web page and search any of these witnesses. You will find the information that they were talking about about reports filed last year or um, uh, different pieces of information. Ron can help you figure out where that might be. Uh, and so, just we will see you Tuesday morning. Um, if you've looked, if you've seen the schedule at all, so Tuesday morning we meet on the floor at 10 a.m. Um, after that, we meet in our respective party caucuses, public caucuses that are held um, before lunch. And then we're back to our, um, our work. We are going to meet with the education committee on Tuesday. We're gonna have a joint hearing with the education committee on, um, there was a piece of legislation at the end of last year that regarded um, the changes that were made to have a statewide teachers uh, contract with respect to insurance, health insurance. And there was some legislation at the end of the year last year that we considered and passed on because of the timing that we will probably consider again soon. There's a deadline of April 1st for some of this information because negotiations on the health insurance contracts start again on um, starting on April 1st. So we'll hear some background on that bill, um, not so much the bill itself, but some background on, on how we got to where we are with it. Um, so that's Tuesday afternoon. And uh, again, enjoy the weekend, treat yourself sleep in late, whatever it is you do to relax, because um, here we are in the middle of it again. Thanks, everybody.